So God, we honor you. We bless you. We will forever declare the most high God. You are an everlasting God. No, no. 
Praise the Lord, Mount Zion, and welcome to Wednesday Bible Study. I am so excited that you have tuned in today. Listen, we are in the Joseph Principle series, and I'm telling you, it has been an incredible blessing. And today, we are in part four, entitled The Call, and it's one that you do not want to miss. And so what I want you to do is I want you to get situated. I want you to get settled. I want you to get whatever it is that you write notes and take notes on because we are getting ready to go deeper than we have before in this fourth installment of the Joseph Principle. Before we head into Bible study, what I want you to do is I want you to help me become a digital disciple. How do you do that? I am so glad you asked. All you have to do, you know how we do it, is hit that share button and let somebody know. Let everyone know who's connected to you on social media that we are live and in living color. Send a tweet out, send a text, and let everybody know. Help us evangelize today, and I promise you it will be a blessing to your life and to all of those who are connected with you. Now, as you're doing that, what I want you to do is I want you to stay connected to our incredible leaders. We have some phenomenal leaders here in the persons of Bishop and Dr. Stephanie Walker. You can follow them right there on social media at Joseph Walker 3 and Dr. Steph Walker. And I promise you, it will be a blessing to your life. We are a relational church and our pastor and our first lady, they are relational leaders and we believe in the power of relationship. So we want you to stay connected and also as as you're following them be sure to stay connected to the life of this ministry by following us at MT Zion Nashville at MT Zion Nashville on all of our social medias because you just never know what's getting ready to happen and what, what we're gonna drop at any given moment and you can be the first in the know well Mount Zion can you just testify in the comments if God has been good to you if God has been good to you can you just put some emojis in the chat can you just testify and say God has been good to me yes I can testify myself that God has been good in spite of ourselves in spite of all that has taken place we can stand and declare that God is good and to that degree and to that end, we give. We give as a generous people because we know that this is good ground. And there's no way that you can sow into fertile ground without reaping a harvest. We give because it is right. We give out of the kindness of our heart. For the Bible says that God loves a what? a cheerful giver. And so what we want you to do right now, what I want you to do, Mount Zion, and to all of our friends and partners around the world, is I want you to get a liberal seed in your hand. I want you to get whatever God has placed on your heart to sow in this moment right now, because I believe a blessing is headed your way, not be based upon the amount that you're giving, but based upon the fact that you're trusting God with your seed. I want you to get that seed in your hand right now. The ways to give are right here on the screen. You can give by text. You can give by our app. You can even mail it in, or you can give on the website. There are just so many ways that you can give, and we don't want you to miss any opportunity to get in on this moment of worship before we head into Bible study. Do you have that seed in your hand? If you do, do you have it? Do you have it? All right, let's pray. Lord, we love you. We bless you. We give you glory. We give you honor. God, we thank you, God, for the gift and the giver. We thank you, God, that, that a blessing is on the way because of the obedience of your people. We give you praise and we give you glory now in Jesus' name. 
Amen. It's just that simple. Giving is not complicated. It is a simple act of worship unto our God. Well, are you ready to head into the fourth part of the Joseph Principle entitled The Call? I tell you what I am. So I want you to get your iPad, get your iPhone, get your Android, get your journal, whatever it is that you're getting ready to take notes on that you typically take notes with. And let's head into the fourth part of the Joseph Principle. Bishop, take it away. Thank you so much. Pastor Bradshaw, I'm so excited. Let's get right into the Word of God today, guys. This is going to be an amazing series, as it already has been, the Joseph Principle. And uh, let's go right into this today. I want to talk today about the call. And since we left last week, you know, it's, it's been two years after the release of the butler and the execution of the baker. Now, what's important here to understand is you can imagine these two years uh, somewhat uh, being discouraging to Joseph because he's still down there in that prison. Today we're going to talk about the call because after looking out for the butler, it seemed like he would have never forgotten it. You ever felt that way? You did something for someone and they just totally forgot about you? But you know what? We learn a lot, some lessons from moments like this. And if we're honest, sometimes, you know, it, it's, it, it's, it's, it's sometimes been able to see the good in what appears to be unrewarding. Sometimes you've got to know that waiting is a common theme in the Christian life. And when you're able to see the good in bad situations and you know that God wouldn't have you out here just waiting for nothing, you know that something powerful is going to happen in your life. Here's the other thing. That God often appoints us to wait much longer than we'd like to. We're anxious, we're ready, but you've got to trust God's timing. And God appoints our starts and our stops. And God's hand was all in this. We've seen it from the very beginning. And while I'm talking to you now, remember that God's hand is in all of what's happening in your life. And this delay, in this moment where you're wondering, Lord, are you going to show up when it's going to happen? But trust me, the butler knew exactly where to find Joseph. And God knows exactly where you are. And if he had been released earlier, who knows? What would have been so there's always a timing <laughs> there's always a divine timing involved when God gets ready to release you into your next blessing in Genesis 41 9 to 13 then the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying I remember my faults this day the Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard both me and the chief baker and we each had a dream in one night he and I. Each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. And now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant, the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. Came to pass, just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office and he hanged him. Now, this is important because the dream and the dilemma of Pharaoh, one of these I want to just say off the bat, Joseph is in prison and there's going to be a discussion happening concerning him in another room. Whatever your situation is now, remember God has people having conversations about you in other rooms. And despite being in the position of great power, here, Pharaoh experiences the same powerlessness as the butler and the baker when they were left in prison. Since none of Pharaoh's Egyptian wise men can make sense out of his dreams. Now, this is a turning point in Joseph's story because in Genesis 41, 14 through 16, this speaks to that because then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. Let that, let that simmer for a second. Joseph is in prison thinking that he's been forgotten about two years later. And then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph because, again, your gift will always make room for you. And they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, shaved him, changed his clothing. He came to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. So think about the amazing anointing on Joseph's life, that God has put him in a position that no one can do what he does. And I have heard it said of you 
that you understand dreams, to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, it's not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. Now, it's important here because when you look at Pharaoh's first dream, let's, let's examine this for a second. Pharaoh was um, standing by the Nile. He saw seven sleek and fat cows grazing among the reeds. And, and, and when he saw another seven cows, those were, were gaunt and ugly, eating the seven beautiful and healthy ones, right? So Pharaoh didn't take this as a mere crazy dream. He knew something was going on. He knew something was happening. And so he knew it was an important lesson in this. So let's find out. Then he had the second dream. Seven good and healthy heads of grain were swallowed up by seven thin and unhealthy heads of grain. And when no one could interpret the dream, it was like a person, you know, who reads the Bible but needs help from another man or woman of God to understand it. So Pharaoh's cupbearer remembered how Joseph had accurately interpreted the dream. So remember, when you're doing and walking in your gift, I'm telling you, <laughs> your gift will make room. People will always remember what you were able to do. And Pharaoh had Joseph called to interpret the dream, and he told uh, Pharaoh that both dreams meant something significant regarding seven years of plenty followed by seven years of severe famine. This is so critical, y'all. And when it was in the timing of God to get Joseph out of prison, it all happened quickly. See, that's what happens when God gets ready to get you out of a situation. <laughs> woo, it's going to happen quickly. Put that in the chat, just quickly, quickly. And often we feel like, you know, there are long periods of time that God doesn't do anything. And we're wondering, God, when are you going to get me out of this? But God's timing is always perfect. It's always right. And everything will always come together in an instant. That's how he works. And here we see another way that Joseph shows us Jesus, who was also taken from a long obscurity to great prominence quickly. Pharaoh gave Joseph an excellent opportunity to glorify himself. Oh, you're the one that do this? You, you're the one that makes this happen? But, but Joseph did not take the bait because Joseph understood this is not an opportunity for me to gloat regarding my gift, but this is only for God's glory. Whatever God does in you through your life, you make sure you don't take credit for it, but you say it was God who gets the glory by what he does in and through my life. So let's get ready for what's about to come. Joseph is prepared to speak to Pharaoh, right? So what's interesting here is that Joseph had no idea that his life was about to take another turn. Keep the story in perspective while presented as a successful dream interpreter, Joseph is also unnamed, a foreigner, more specifically a Hebrew, a slave, a lad, which seems more like a status than an age, since he is now around 30 years old in prison. Now, it's important to get this because Joseph's, you know, <laughs> being seen as a foreigner does not stop Pharaoh from seeking help from a Hebrew slave. Pharaoh was impressed enough with the story to give Joseph a chance to interpret the dream. He's heard all this, so Pharaoh gets beyond all the hangups. And if you note the shift in grammar in the three parts of this verse. First, Pharaoh sends people to call for Joseph. He sends people to call for Joseph. Secondly, those people rush Joseph from the dungeon. And thirdly, Joseph shaves or changes his clothes and comes before Pharaoh. This is significant, and I want you to understand. The shift to the third person singular at the end shows that Joseph was active in preparing himself for the meeting. They sent for him, they came and brought him, but Joseph shaved and changed the garment and reflected more than just the, nece the necessity of just cleaning himself up before seeing the king, but it shows a willingness to adapt to a surrounding culture. You know, Levites or Levinites like Joseph, they wore beards. Egyptians did not. So Joseph is prepared to speak about God. So now he comes into this space 
And he's about to talk about all that God is doing. Because when you go into certain platforms and spaces, it can be tempting to glorify your gift. It can be tempting to talk about how amazing you are. And you water down the message. <laughs> and you miss it, the opportunity to really help what God is doing in and through you have a larger platform and a larger audience. Let me talk to you for a second. In the prison, pay attention here, Joseph tells the baker and the butler that the interpretation belonged to God. He takes the attention away from himself. It belongs to God. Now that he's in front of Pharaoh, he could have used his platform to take credit, but yet he reminds himself and remains consistent in the same lesson, the interpretation belongs to God. Whatever God is doing through you, please remind people, this gift belongs to God. This voice belongs to God. These hands belong to God. Whatever God is doing in my life, God gets the glory. Because see, when elevation comes, you have to remain consistent. The larger platform doesn't mean you have to change your message and change fundamentally who you are. Be yourself. Don't change what got you to this point. There's a certain character and nature that Joseph has. You gotta understand that when you're called to service, show up as yourself. Show up. People are calling you to show up as yourself. And this is why it's so important, because a larger platform does not mean that you, you show up in a disingenuous way. Remain authentic, because no matter when and where you are, when people call you, they're calling for the authentic person to show up. Your gift will get you through the door. Oh, yeah but consistency will keep you there. And instead of taking the credit for himself, Joseph invokes God. But at the same time, he stands ready to interpret, confident in his access in the divine wisdom of God. When you walk in these spaces, man, go in there confident, confident about your gifting. Don't second guess it. God gave you a gift, walk through that door and be confident that God has assigned you to do this now. Listen, people of God, this is a season to be confident in what God has called you to do. And let me help you understand, it's so important as we shift here because I think it's important you think about the level of confidence that you have and you think about what God is doing. You have to begin now to view this as God gives his opportunity for our agency. What are you saying, Pastor? Well, God gives us gifts and opportunity but God also gives us human agency. What does that mean? Well, in theory, Joseph's task is done. Pharaoh wanted to know what the dream meant and Joseph told him. But Joseph understands that for his fortune to be transformed, he needs to express his own agency and develop relationships with those who are in power. As such, he's not blind to the opportunity in the situation that's been afforded to him, and he continues by suggesting a solution to the problem posed by the dream. Anybody can interpret the dream, but Joseph knows here's an opportunity to bring a solution. You know, Erasmus Marr, in his book, Understanding Human Agency, suggests three things, and I paraphrase. He suggests, one, agency is active. Remember in Genesis 41, 33, and 35, now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Here we find that Joseph is solution-oriented. Boy, Lord, help us here. He actively offers a plan for Pharaoh's problems. And this is how you make human agency work. Often we look at the natural order as purely scientific, but agency is a part of the natural order. Think about it from a developmental standpoint. There's a certain idea, certain ideas that started from one person in their home. And as their product became more popular and exposed, 
The product goes from being made in their home to being produced by a factory. Thus, the product is now shipped all around the world. It's still the same product, just sold to a larger scale and on a larger platform. At the end of the day, it is still made in its natural order, and this is the way the manufacturer intended it to work. Your life's journey will go through seasons of elevation, but you must, listen, you must still operate as the manufacturer God intended for you to work. At this point, Joseph gave Pharaoh knowledge, telling him what would happen as revealed in the dreams. But he also says, this is how you apply wisdom and knowledge. He's solution-oriented. A lot of people can tell you the what, but can't tell you what to do about what they just told you. It's good to remember the difference between knowledge and wisdom, right? Because knowledge tells you what's going on. Wisdom tells you what to do about it. Knowledge is the diagnosis, and wisdom, ladies and gentlemen, is directed to the cure. Knowledge is good and necessary, but it's not enough. Our world has a lot more knowledge than wisdom. Do you see the order in the text? It is God-given wisdom. Joseph has it. Joseph saw that this great crisis is coming and he needed proper administration. <laughs> the problem had to be understood. The goal and the vision to meet the goal had to be formulated. The right people had to be in place, officers of the land. They had to understand the big vision and their role in it. Someone had to make sure it was all operating according to plan. The work had to be measured because agency is intentional. Joseph's plan is an intentional effort, right? It is intentional. He plainly states the goal. In Genesis 41, 36 through 38, then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt, and the land may not perish during the famine. So the advice was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all of his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man whom is the Spirit? or the Spirit of God dwells. See, the job of this wise man, Joseph, the job is to organize a system. This is so important, y'all, because I thank God for this anointing. To organize a system of food storage throughout Egypt, putting away the excess grain from the years of plenty to support the people during the, during the years of famine. It's just that simple. And through, though Joseph does not specify that he should be the wise man, Pharaoh does, and he doesn't mind naming him just that. Matter of fact, Pharaoh understood that Joseph not only had the right interpretation of a dream, this is going to bless somebody, but also had the advice to respond to the message from heaven. Pharaoh had plenty of preachers, y'all, magicians. He had holy men around him. That had nothing to do with your gift, though. <laughs> Here's the deal, because what he did not have until Joseph was a man who had the Spirit of God. This made Joseph stand out among the officers, hence his words, can we find such a one as this? You can have talent and gift, you can have all those things, but what separates you is the fact that the hand of God is on your life. When God's hand is on your life, it separates you from all the other people. You can walk into the same interview with other folks, but people will see something different on you. This is the first mention in the Bible of the Holy Spirit coming upon a man. It is interesting to note that it was in regard to more practical things. Joseph didn't have to preach a sermon, to lead a prayer for Pharaoh, to see the Spirit of God upon him. He could see it in his character, in his message, in his knowledge. See, we, we often miss this how the Holy Spirit can be seen in wisdom and seen in humility. We often associate the Holy Spirit with how well somebody can preach, how anointed they are. We miss the fact the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit can be seen in very practical ways in our character and in our humility. 
Because what's done in secret will be made public. In Genesis 41, 39 to 42, Pharaoh said to Joseph, in so much as God has shown you all this, there is no one discerning, as discerning as wise as you. You shall be over my house of all the people and shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to my throne will I be greater than you. Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over the land of Egypt. Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in the garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And this was the first firm indication that Pharaoh wanted Joseph to be the one to save Egypt through wise planning, preparation. And you know it probably surprised Joseph. Let me put a pin here for a second. Joseph lost his coat to his brothers. God told me to tell somebody, stop whining over the coat you lost or the coat that was taken because Pharaoh's got a robe he's about to put on top of you. <laughs> Joseph, y'all, has done in private what he did in private in Potiphar's house to the prison is now on a national platform. We often associate what's done in private or what's done in the dark coming to light from a negative perspective. But such is the same in positive situations because what you do when no one is watching will eventually come to light. Think about it. Jesus says when you go and pray to your father in secret, he'll reward you openly. So when God calls leaders, he gives them gifts to serve both the creator and humanity. However, these gifts must be accompanied by a righteous character. Joseph had two major gifts. He had a gift of interpreting dreams and was an excellent manager of that. So good were his management skills that Potiphar put him in charge of his whole household. Pharaoh gave him the whole of Egypt to manage. But Joseph also was a wise man. He would not sleep with his master's wife, and he forgave his brothers who had sold him into slavery, and he recognized that it was God who had sent him to Egypt to save humanity and his own family. Do you know something? If you're called leadership, y'all know I talk a lot about leadership in my podcast. I hope you go out and download it. If you don't listen to Next Level Leader Podcast, what's up? Go and subscribe to it. It's free. Next Level Leader Podcast, Dr. Joseph Walker, because leadership is the space your pastor lives. See, if you call the leadership, you got to recognize your gift and use it to serve God, the church, and humanity. Joseph only seemed to be an overnight success to people that didn't understand the journey. The truth is the journey went from a pit to a pinnacle, and it took 13 years. People think you just popped up. They don't realize there's been a whole story that's being written. The story reminds us of some important principles of promotion and advancement. Because promotion and advancement is from the Lord. Y'all know this. Psalm 75, 6 and 7, one of my favorite scriptures for promotion or exaltation comes neither from the east nor the west nor the south, but it comes from God who is the judge who puts down one and exalts another. You know, this is not to say that hard work and preparation, good habits and other human aspects do not contribute to success. They, they clearly do. Yet even those things are gifts and abilities from God and should be regarded with humility and gratitude toward him. Promotion and advancement is never enough without the Lord. You can't be so promoted or advanced to where you stop needing Jesus. Often promotion and success makes us see our need for Jesus even more. I mean, not a day goes by I don't need him in my life. Jesus received the ultimate promotion or advancement because Joseph's path from humility as an humble servant and a prisoner to a powerful ruler becomes a prophecy of Jesus Christ himself. Philippians 2, 5, and 11, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. 
And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. And therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow and those in heaven and those on earth and those under heaven, under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. Let me tell you something, y'all. Joseph ends up as prime minister. The years of plenty come to pass. How do you go from a prisoner to a prime minister? Joseph was a young man. He had much authority. Yet, he had been in God's school of trust, deepening and character development for a long time since he was sold as a slave at age 17 years of age. And Joseph did what was right. He actually stored up the grain during the seven years of plenty. And this was significant logistically and from an accounting perspective. It was challenging, but yet he did it. And it seems that it was customary for Pharaoh to take 10% of the grain in Egypt as a tax. Essentially, Joseph doubled the taxes over the next seven years. Genesis 41 and 34 mentions one-fifth. That's 20%. Joseph's offspring, y'all, and his heart need to be examined because from his Egyptian wife, Joseph fathered Manasseh, whose name means forgetfulness. This was because God made Joseph to forget all the previous pain and the trials of his life. God's going to make you forget it, forgetting those things which are behind you. But the second psalm was Ephraim, which means fruitfulness, because God would make Joseph fruitful in Egypt. Remember, Joseph would be a fruitful bow going over the wall. See, you can't be doubly fruitful until we are also forgetting. In the book, the great book, The Great Divorce, C.S. Lewis describes hell as a place where no one forgets anything. Remembering every slight, every cruel exchange of words, every wrong thing ever done to them, and everybody is ultimately and utterly unforgiving. But in heaven, all things are put away because all things have become new. Joseph did not forget the faith of his fathers, even though he rose to great glory in Egypt. He had an Egyptian wife. And as a sign of this, his children were given Hebrew names, not Egyptian names. The years of famine began. And because of Joseph's wise preparation, please hear this, y'all. Egypt became a supply source for the whole region, which suffered the severe famine. I think your pastor spoke this over this house, right? And no matter what happens in the world, that God will use the Mount Zion church because of the Joseph principle to be an economic force in the community. The people of Canaan, including Joseph's family, suffered from the famine, but God made wise, though unexpected provision for them by sending Joseph ahead of his family. And as we know that all things, <laughs> they do work together, all of it, for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. God took this Joseph through obscurity, through all these different seasons to set him up as a prime minister. And it would be Joseph who would be in a position of prominence now in Egypt, second in command to Pharaoh himself, a man who was in Pharaoh's prison. Now he's second in command because God gave him an administrative anointing to distribute now bread in the midst of a famine. We'll talk about that next week, but God's going to use you to do something extraordinary. And when God calls you, he's calling you up. Not, God will never call you out unless he's calling you up. I pray you've been blessed. I thank God for his word. And I hope you have received it today. Listen, I'm going to give you an opportunity today to receive the call from God out. 
I know it may have been a while. Hey, Lord, it's taking so long. When are you going to use me? When is it going to happen? God says, look now, my timing is perfect. If you need a relationship with him, you're better to walk in your divine purpose and assignment. You, you want a church home? Right here. I want you to text me. M-T-Z salvation at 94,000. That is M-T-Z salvation 94,000. Text us right now. Our team will connect with you. Wherever you are around the world, we want you to be a part and to grow with us. Because if you're going with us, you got to grow with us. God bless you and thank you so much. We got one more part of this series, guys. You ready? The Joseph Principle is going down. I cannot wait until next time. I pray God bless you and yours. That's my prayer. See you next week. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's Bible study, and I pray you have been blessed. You know, we here at Mount Zion believe God has allowed us to grow as disciples, and as a consequence, we believe our time, talent, and treasure matters. We are mature believers, and I want to give you an opportunity, if you missed it earlier, to sow, to give. If you've been blessed, I want you to put seed into good ground through your tithe, your offering, sow a liberal seed right now. The platforms are right here. Make sure you do that. And we thank God. Also, let us know if you're being blessed. We would love to hear from you. And we appreciate you so much. May God bless you. Is our prayer.